Welcome everybody to uh, this morning's clinical research professional training series. Um, just as a reminder uh, to please go ahead and mute yourself. Um, the other thing is if you have questions during the presentation, please go ahead and put those questions in the chat and we will try to get those questions answered um, at the end of the presentation. I'd like to welcome today uh, Penny Jester who I've known since I've been here at OSU. Um, she is currently an adjunct um, faculty professor and she teaches um, various courses in the Masters of Clinical Research. Um, that is an asynchronous um, graduate uh, degree that is offered through The Ohio State University. If you haven't heard about it, um, please contact me and I can give you some further information. Um, Penny Jester has worked at the University of Alabama um, and has actually been in the business, so to speak, for quite some time. And uh, her dossier would go on for quite some time. So without further ado, I give you Penny Jester, who's going to be speaking to us about quality in our clinical research. Penny? Hey, thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this program. A couple of things I would tell you at the beginning, and, and one of them is that there's a lot of information here. And if you want to improve your clinical research site, and you know, there's a, a laundry list of things that can be done to improve quality, pick one or two things and just start that way. It's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty big task. And again, hopefully you're doing some of them, but again, just keep that in the back of your mind so you don't feel overwhelmed. Um, also, a little bit more about me. I have, as Karen said, I've been in research quite a while. I've been doing it since um, uh, for 27 years or so, and my roles have changed. Uh, my undergraduate degree was a nurse. I was in hospitals for a little while, went to school, uh, got a degree in public health, and then from there got sucked into research because that's what happens when you do research. You get sucked into it, I think. I, my roles varied and they grew as time went on. I actually started in the lab with animals, which was, but they were big cow. They were big cows. They were big pigs. They were like 80 pound pigs. So they weren't cute, but nonetheless, that was for a short period. I then was a study coordinator. Um, eventually I got involved in being the director of an international collaborative antiviral study group, which did, of all things, viruses. We could talk about that for quite a while if you'd want, but that's not the topic today. But we oversaw protocols. We were acted rather like the sponsor. And um, we, we did four or five protocols at one time. And in my office, I had, you know, we had managers and coordinators, and um, we even had for a period of time, we had monitors. So we, again, acted like the sponsor without manufacturing the drug. What this, and the reason I even bring that up is what it did, it gave me a really good view of what goes on at clinical research sites. And so early on, I, this became an important issue, quality and training and education for clinical research sites. Because um, we, with our protocols, we oversaw somewhere between 28 and up to, we had one protocol, uh, which was actually a West Nile virus one uh, that had like 70 sites. And um, so we acted again, like the sponsor, like the CRO, and it just fed my, my passion for this whole topic of quality. Um, at, at UAB, as, as Karen mentioned, um, I was also involved with the CTSA. Um, again, as, I, as time evolved, I had several roles as, as always occurs in, in academic institutions. And so again, I saw the strength that a CTSA could bring to directing you know, quality. So let me begin. And again, I'm gonna go back and say it one more time. There's a lot of information here. Um, I tried not to put too much in, but I also just want to, to make you all hungry for, for improving the quality of your research sites. So basically we're gonna talk about uh, what, a, what quality in clinical research is. We're gonna define that. 
Um, we're going to look at the activities of a quality research site, and there's seven of them listed here. I won't read through those because we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, we'll discuss a quality culture because it isn't just one thing, is it? It's, it's many, it's, it's really the whole environment that you work in that's important. Talk about the benefits. And then finally, can you really afford not to build a quality program? So what is quality? It's where you, you meet the stake, stakeholders' expectations and requirements. So who are the stakeholders? Well, you know, I think immediately you think, well, the sponsor. Well, the public, the study subject, the FDA, the, IND, um, the IRBs, um, your staff, the whole research team, those are all stakeholders and all of their opinions and expectations should be considered. Um, zero defects attitude, we'll talk about this a bit more, but indeed, I think I would, it'll, it'll come up again. But what I want you to understand is, um, no, we can't be 100% right all the time. And that's usually what you think of when you think of zero defects. But look at the, the final word there is attitude. It's an attempt at make every attempt possible to make sure that there are no errors. Granted, keep in mind what we're looking at here for quality, just to repeat this, is it's about the clinical research site, right? And if the intent of the, you know, not to accept, oh, you know, we made a mistake there. Okay, that was just one out of 100. Well, why did that one out of 100 occur? Um, do we need to change our training? Do we need to change some of the guidelines we give our staff? Again, having the attitude that you want to eliminate any and all possible errors. And again, it won't happen, but if you have the attitude, you'll be awfully close. Are your goals achieved? What quality is achieving the goals you set for yourself, right? Um, how many protocols do you want to complete over a certain period of time? Um, again, it can be a variety of things. And I don't think we always think about this, but job satisfaction is critical in a quality environment. If you have a quality environment, again, you're as we mentioned about the stakeholders, you're not only addressing the needs of, of all the predicted people, the predictable people like the sponsor and the subject, but the staff, it makes a difference. So I'm gonna bring in somebody from industry. This is um, Philip Crosby. He was kind of a big guru in quality management and quality. And he had four basic principles that he went by that I think are worth thinking about and considering. Um, Quality means meeting demands and expectations. Okay, we already mentioned the stakeholders and what did they want. Prevention ensures quality. Think about that. If, if you have preventive measures in place, your quality is gonna be better and it's gotta be through the whole process. Performance is assessed using zero defects as a standard. We already discussed that. Quality is measured in financial terms. Now, you know, coming from a healthcare background, it's kind of like, well, money doesn't matter. We just need to give the best care we can. But yes, money does matter because how can you provide, you know, good services if you don't have enough money, if the sponsors don't want to pay, you know, if, if because you're making so many mistakes. Again, it's very important to, to keep, you know, finances are important in quality. Sometimes people talk about, you know, think of, think, they think of quality as, oh, that's compliance. We're always compliant. There is a difference. Compliance is part of quality, but quality is much more. Compliance is a conformance to the regulations. Quality is a standard to achieve the best possible. Compliance is a minimum standard. And that's not what we want with research. We want to go above it. And in fact, I won't read through all of these, but the bottom line is the FDA states compliance is not enough. And therefore, let's look at quality. The FDA wants us to be looking at quality. Characteristics of a quality research site. Again, just some symptoms one might use um, or state or describe starts before taking on a trial, ends when there is no longer, when you're no longer doing research. Everyone knows what they're doing. I often felt that when putting together a research team, 
I might have had a data entry person and I wanted that person to do their job 100% correct, but they're not, they're only going to be able to do it that well is if they understand the jobs of the people around them. It helps them in problem solving. Um, again, people shouldn't be working in silos and only with their own knowledge, but have a, at least a good understanding of the people around them. Um, everyone knows what they're doing. That's what I just described. Patients, subjects are safer. safer. Um, you have a retention of staff, which will come up again. And that's, again, uh, uh, if you include quality as a satisfied team, you're going to be able to retain your staff better. It's a beacon for sponsors. Um, I can, and I'll refer to this, there is a group that I'm working with right now, in addition to teaching at Ohio State, we're trying, and it's a group of about eight very seasoned researchers from across the country. We're trying to develop an accreditation that would be used by research sites, expecting them to have, that they would have quality programs and they would be certified in that or accredited. And therefore, what is it? The sponsors are going to be thrilled with that. Um, teamwork, you know, again, another strong characteristic of a quality research site. So then there are seven elements that I just want to talk about that would could be broken out of a clinical research site that could be built on to increase and improve the quality. So let's look at management. Again, some of the ideals are they have a vision, mission, and values statement. Again, everybody knows why they're there. I mean, that's sort of a um, what you could almost argue we already know what our values are. Well, but again, stating them and having them not known by the staff. Having a rigorous protocol selection process. You know, every protocol is going to be different, but what is the process? So, a, to, to step to the side for a minute, the other thing to think about is a lot of these the points that we bring up can be addressed by policies, procedures, and standard SOPs, standard operating procedures. Again, those are things that you could, you know, fit in here as well. Having clear roles and responsibilities for the clinical research site, making sure you know everybody's skill. Um, Again, it puts you further ahead when you go to protocol selection and when you're implementing a trial. Clear communication processes within the team from the lead to the, to the person who's entering the data, to the person who's doing the IRB, to the, to the patients um, or the study subjects. Strong ethics and ethical standard or statement that you would go by. Clear protocol implementation processes Again, I realize every protocol is different, so it makes it a little bit challenging, but having a standard by which you determine how the protocol, a protocol might be implemented, who's involved in those decisions would be a very important aspect. Information management, and this goes for so many things, it's probably that one doesn't even need to be said, but having a clear description of how you will manage not just the protocol documents, but your internal documents. This is probably the one I like the best. It's quality activities because we don't, I can tell you that I didn't do this as much as I should have when I was running sites. Um, record keeping and confidentiality, yes, that would be done and you have to have a clear standard for that. Quality improvement processes. You know, having a means by which, and again, that sort of ties into continuous quality improvement where you not only look for errors in real time, but you also fix them immediately. And then on a annual, biannual basis, you, you may revise your processes if you see a problem that's more than a one-off. Um, but you have to have a system in place to review them and to state it. Um, and again, I'll just throw this out there. Let's say you're looking at deviations. Yes, they, and deviation occurs. The first thing you would do is, okay, so we had a deviation. What was the problem? Did you not have the information? You know, I'm talking to the staff. Did you not have the information you needed? What could I have provided you? Um, and then you look at the deviations in aggregate for a protocol, for all your protocols. Maybe you look at your deviations quarterly to see if you have a pattern. And then maybe you're going to change your processes. You're going to in, in, 
include some education for the whole staff or for the staff that it applies to. But again, it's the immediacy and correcting the immediate problem and then looking at changing processes and SOPs over a period of time, but doing it in a regimented way. Having a corrective action plan that you, that you use and allowing for innovation. You know, staff will have some really great ideas. So inviting their input is really important in a quality office. This is one which is probably not, not as critical. I mean, certainly risk managing and mitigating. I mean, it is critical, but it's probably one that everybody's doing. Adverse event, event, adverse event management. Most of the sites that I've ever worked with do have a means, it's just a standard process. If an adverse event occurs, these are the steps you take. Granted, again, I do realize it will change some of it changes per protocol, but there are standard things that your site should do. Um, and then going back to the top, sorry for reversing the order, defining processes to assess for risk. Not only, and this is the, the one we look at the most is protocol and safety of the subject. Absolutely. What about staff risks? Is adding another protocol increasing the risk to the staff? Is adding more infectious disease studies a greater risk to the staff? Um, I don't, you know, it, again, but you have to look at those things. And then research site risks. What, do we have enough space for these, for more study subjects? And then the financial part fits into there. Taking on a protocol, if we don't have the right budget, what is that a risk? How does that risk impact our office? Um, and again, mitigating would be included in all of these as well. People-centered workforce. As I mentioned in the beginning, I think the thing that we as, because we're not trained in this, if most of us, my background was nursing, my background was a master's in public health, I didn't get any management skills. So, but this is so critical is how you, you deal with your staff, you know, that it's centered on them. Um, having an open door policy of allowing people to bring in their concerns, their complaints, and I think to me, this is just a really great one, near misses. You know, we, you know, sometimes, let's say someone almost forgot to consent a patient or didn't give them a, they forgot to consent a patient. And they say, I got it. But sharing that with someone, sharing that with your team and saying, you know, I almost missed this. How can we make sure we don't have near misses? Because some near misses are going to end up in problems. So near misses are valuable and important to look at. Trust in the that trust in the management strengthens teamwork. Um, so there's a communication issue here. Training and skill mix review and maintenance. Again, looking at each of your staff. You know what have a strong list of the skill mix. What can everybody do? What you know what are they capable of doing? And what therefore you can also see where your training needs need to fit in. Um, and also, you know, who's maybe weak in consenting? Well, let's make sure we're there to help them and do some uh, modeling with them on consenting. Clearly documented, provided training, kind of a, a no-brainer, but one that is not um, always appreciated. And I would tell you that I'm working with uh, the group that's working on workforce task, uh, workforce task force. That's what we are. But we're working on trying to describe and explain and understand what is needed by the workforce. And having required and supported education is not all we have found is not always there. Study subject centered care. You know, say again, these are pretty basic. I don't think this is things that most people won't do. But you know, safety is an issue, thorough assessments of those subjects and you know, having that des designed and described as an SOP, safe environment, um, knowledge to your study subject, it goes through the consenting and then continuous communications through the whole protocol. Again, these are standards you need to have. And education, educating your study subject, that's something that certainly helps them with their compliance and it helps the success of any clinical trial. But having that is a critical part of every study that is done. Clinical trial facility, not much can be said here. This is probably something that does get done and, and probably is fairly well documented. Meets protocols, expectations, and requirements. You know, you're not going to take on a protocol if you can't uh, do an MRI um, and it's required. 
meet the needs, meets the needs of the clinical research team? I mean, do you have enough space or people sitting on top of each other? Granted, we it's often, I'm, I will say this again, it's often a challenge and some of these we can't meet right now, but it's something that would make for greater team satisfaction if people have adequate space. Storage facilities, always a nightmare, but a necessary one. So also the final um, aspect of a, a quality clinical research site is evaluations and assessments and audits that are built in. Um, identify your key performance indicators. What do you want to measure? You know, what, let's, for example, um, if you are trying to enroll X number of subjects, let's say 100 subjects in six months, and at three months, you know you need 50. And so you, you want to gauge at, fifth, at the six-month period, the halfway point, that you have actually enrolled the number you wanted. Again, that, that would be a key performance indicator, but you would also look at all of your studies together. How successful are we at rolling the total amount in the time period we told the sponsor? Um, there are, you know, deviations can be in this. Um, the number of protocols that you bring on. Performance, key performance indicators, you know, can be a, a plethora of things. I mean, it can even be the monitor report. You know, what, how many exceptions or how many errors do you want to see on your monitor report? Granted, it can depend on the monitor. I understand that. But to look at the data, to look at the issues on a regular basis is helpful. Continually collect data on performance of a site. As I mentioned, deviations, enrollment rates, are you meeting your expectations? What does your budget look like? Are you meeting it? Again, you have the standards in place, but you need to go back and look to see if you're meeting your goals. Otherwise, and then you can, again, as we had said earlier on you, and then you make your improvements. Continuous review and immediate correction of errors and regular review and implement processes um, to implement process improvement and chance. A chance, I think it's change, excuse me for the typo. Um, hopefully there's no chance. So where are we? So let me step back and at an article I read the other day and it was from November 21. They had done, um, a survey was done of about a hundred clinical research sites. 75% of them had staffing challenges. Part of this, I know, is due to COVID. It, part of it's due to the one of the, the challenges we have right now is the evolving nature of research. Technology is becoming a bigger issue. Pressure on success is becoming a bigger issue. Um, it's, there, there's a lot of turmoil right now, generally, I believe, in clinical research as we get to a new normal. And so that's part of what the staffing issues may be related to. But if we can build systems that um, are, are attractive to people, we, the people we hire, <coughs> excuse me, then um, that should help with staffing issues. But it's, you know, it's a big challenge. 50% 50 reported they had challenges with and problems with research budgets and contracts. 38% long study initiation timelines were challenged by those. 25% were challenged by trial enrollment. 25% burden of remote or monitoring, of remote monitoring and audits. Again, we get into the, the current technology. Um, 19 is technology burden. Some of these we can't affect. Some of these are just going to be um, in our faces until we can deal with them. But if we can build a better infrastructure to be flexible, but to be rigorous in the standards we expect, it, the studies will go, again, we can overcome some of these challenges. You know, an interest, another thing, I didn't have it down here, but another challenge we have in research right now is the number of clinical investigators. In the past six to eight years, we have gone from 15,000 um, across the country, 15,000 clinical investigators, PIs, to roughly 10,000. We've lost a third. 
several ways of looking at that. As you all know, many people get into research because they think they want to do it, and then they realize how much work it is, especially PIs. And they say, well, I, you know, I don't think I want to do this after all. And it's be it has become more complex over time. So maybe that's part of it. But what if, what if we had clinical research sites that ran extremely smoothly and, and were very successful? Um, maybe we wouldn't lose the, you know, the investigators, you know, we would, we would have plenty of investigators. Again, time, you know, we can only try. So the other part of a quality clinical research site is the culture. And I've referred to that throughout, but it's a little bit, it's just, I wanted to present some of the definitions to you. So set group of values that guide how improvements are made to everyday working practices and outputs. In a quality culture, there is, the one I like best is the next, in a quality culture, there is no need to check final output. Indeed, to do so is to shift responsibility away from those involved at each stage. This truly emphasizes the importance of every person who's involved in clinical research. And you don't just wait till the end to see if you're successful. You think about the process in the middle and you measure and, and watch closely, you know, and all the things we've mentioned, enrollment rates, um, clean CRFs, consenting, rates of consenting or rates of errors in consenting. Again, you don't wait till the end to look at it. You look at it through the process. And the culture is supportive of this. The culture encourages, you know, a constant self-check, a constant systematic review as well. So in clinical research, again, much of what we've already said, so the quality culture would have established standards for management, rigorous reviews of risks and risk mitigation, very people-focused, pursue quality, not compliance, get feedback from your end user, whoever that is, whether it's a sponsor, whether it's the financial people, whether it's, you know, talk to your staff, get, you know, they're also important, talk to the study subjects, get feedback from them, implementing continuous quality improvement, as we've said. So again, I, I think I have become a bit repetitive here. I'm just trying to hope I, I get the point to you all that, again, constant a quality research site would have a constant review of key indicators, correct weaknesses, and then strengthen the processes, have a strong teamwork and confidence staff, engaged management, keep a zero defects attitude, and regular review of processes. The outcomes. So what would be the result of a clinical research site who had a quality program? Hopefully lower staff turnover rates because of job satisfaction. Stakeholders satisfaction is high, which would mean to me that the sponsor is going to come back to you again. That's one person. Then study subjects, if they're satisfied, may look at another study sometime down the road. Um, additionally, you know, if, if a study subject is satisfied, they're going to probably be more compliant during the study. So there are many ways of, of looking at this. Um, decrease and monitor time and corrective actions directed by sponsor or CRO. This is a very important one. Think about this, and, and it ties into increase in profits. So years ago, when I when I was working and I, one of my clinical coordinators who was just doing the pharma studies, I knew she had a monitor coming to see her. And I said, you know, are you all set? I went to her before the monitor came. I said, you all set? Do you need anything? She said, nah, I never prepare. I just, you know, the monitor will tell me what she wants. And that's true and it's not true. Um, monitors are there just to double check what you were supposed to have done. Wouldn't wouldn't you take on the initiative to be prepared for that monitor? Because if you think about it, there is a cost to not being prepared. A monitor is going to come for, maybe she's, she or he set us up a time to be there for four days, or you're, you're thinking they might stay three to four days. When he or she go through your consent forms, when they go through your source documents and they're verifying your, your CRFs, um, when they're checking your regulatory documents, if everything is in order, 
They have no problems to write down. You don't have to go back and fix something and then have them re-review it. All of that takes time. Um, someone mentioned to me that, you know, well, sponsors don't really care. They just give a lump sum to the CRO and the CRO spends it as they like. Again, I don't want to badmouth CROs because I don't think everybody is out to do that just to spend all the money they can. But I think if a, if a sponsor realizes how well you are doing as a site, that the monitor has less time to spend with you and your office has less time to do having to spend on cleanup, there is a money savings aspect there. Um, and one could argue that if sponsors get to the point where they really, they recognize quality sites, you know, certainly they're going to be sending more protocols to those sites. Additionally, there's clearly a decrease in the risk for study subjects if you have a quality site. I've referred to this somewhat, but what do the sponsors say? They would have more confidence in the data. Again, what do the sponsors have to say about a quality clinical research site? They have more confidence in the data. Um, again, possibly a decreased cost for monitoring, shortened time to overall study completion, and more confident in their site selection. It is just, it, there is no, there's no downside for them. So I mentioned earlier the group I was working with, it's the Site Accreditation and Standards Institute, and please feel free to look it up. We're all volunteer now, so there's, we're not, just because we're trying to see if we can establish an accreditation program. Uh, we've met with the FDA, we've met with a number of sponsors, we did meet with NCATS. Again, we're still sort of fledgling, we're just getting started. It's going to be a few years, I think, before if we're going, if we are successful, we will be. But our accreditation will be like OHARP or Joint Commission. I mean, again, and yet I can tell you we're going to probably be more rigorous than both for a couple of reasons. One of the people who's working with us was part of OHARP for a while and helped develop the initial program and the accreditation process. And so we're kind of taking lessons learned from that and trying to implement them. But again, quality culture is a key parameter that we're looking at and setting up standards for clinical research sites. And I'm sure as you're thinking, is it possible? And I believe me, coming from an academic institution, I thought the same thing, is it possible? And I think it is. I think it's going to, again, it's requiring a culture change. But I do think just looking at the standards, just thinking about the, the seven items of a quality research site that I mentioned, um, that's important. And they are, again, you take one or two of them and work on them and develop them um, into a quality part of a quality program, then um, you'll get there. It is a slow process. I just, um, but it's, it's one that's worth spending our time on. So I think that's it. I have a few references at the end that I've used. Um, so does anyone have any questions? So if you have some questions, um, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, or if you want to unmute yourself temporarily and ask your question of Penny, I would encourage you to do so. I do want to point out, um, but first, thank you, Penny. That was um, very inspirational to me. Um, I do want to stress one of the things that you spoke about, which was that everyone knows what they are doing, but even more so what their colleagues do um, because that helps with the problem solving of what happens before you get the information and where your information goes, the upstream and the downstream. And that speaks a lot to something that we have been working on, which is the team science. Um, and this is looking at um, the research team as not, you've got the um, investigator and then you have the quality coordinators and that they're separate entities. They're all one team. And it's very important that they communicate as to what their expectations are, or like you had mentioned, um, the near misses, something almost happened. Well, why was that? Was it um, information that they didn't receive on time? 
or was it a lack of documentation? But those near misses are very key in making sure that you um, look at those as to why they may have almost happened. Because as you said, the next time it may happen. Um, so one of the questions is, how do we motivate investigators to be quality minded? Okay, Jennifer, so here's what I would tell you. Don't ask that question. I'm only kidding. It, it is one of the hardest ones because it comes down to, and I'd love to hear others input on this. It's the culture we have built that it isn't something that investigators think about. And so it's, you know, constantly trying to drive the fact that this will improve the research and it could even make their lives easier. Um, and the sponsors will be happier. Uh, you know, certainly those are kind of key things for them, but it is, it is the biggest, it is a big challenge. And it's because of how we have designed clinical research in academic centers specifically. Um, because I, you know, as you all know, I mean, how many, how many investigators were, were doctors and says, oh, I think I'll do this trial without any preconceived idea or preconceived knowledge about how even to do a clinical research trial. Um, and that's why if we can begin again, as I repeating myself, begin to build offices that have quality in them, that I think that will, we will get them on board. I know that many institutions are now are beginning to require training of investigators. And so this would be part of it. Um, it's always hard to mandate anything at this point in time, but you know, that's, and so they often attend the courses at, at their will, which doesn't always help um, everyone for sure. But Jennifer, it was a good question. And it's kind of the, kind of the elephant in the room, but I think we can, I'm just hopeful that we can address it. I think again, it comes back to changing the research culture. I hope that helped or just added to the confusion. I can add one um, item or an example to that of a study that I was aware of that when it went to the FDA for approval, um, one of the tests, the documentation of it was not clear. And so the FDA requested or told the investigator that they had to go back and collect an additional six months of this particular assessment and then represent it um, because it was so messy as, as right. they use other terms. But, um, <laughs> and so this prolonged the trial Mm -hmm. And so there again, that's a quality. It wasn't that it was non-compliant. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was very hard to read the data and see how it flowed. And so they requested that there be a six month repeat, watching some of the uh, things and laying it out better. Right. So again, mm -hmm. it can add to the trial. And, and so that's why that culture is important that it, it, was it the PI that did it that way? No, but he approved of it that way. So um, I think that's an important one. Our good. next question is, is there anything you would add for non-sponsors clinical trial research such as NIH funded investigator initiated? Where I guess is NIH any? is not exactly monitored in the same way. Right, well, let me think, let me talk a little bit and then please re-ask your question if I don't answer it. I would, my experience with NIH was I did all, our contracts were all with the DMID and we were required to have monitoring and they paid. So I think, so that's one thing, but I do think, but I do, I am aware that there were other um, NIH institutes that maybe did not provide funds to do monitoring. Um, and early on, I would tell you, we we kind of did it, we did it, if, if I'm answering it correctly, when I first started with the group I was working with, um, although we did get money from the NIH, we did our own monitoring, which was a little bit of a conflict of interest, and so we stopped doing it. But it is doable to... Um, now I'm thinking I'm not answering your question. Um, 
it is challenging. It is challenging if you don't have the funds to do the monitoring. And in this day and age, I'm not sure. I think, you know, you, you still have to double check. I mean, you have to double check yourself. So again, I, I have to admit, I think I missed the question. Well, Hi, I, Penelope, I can you hear me? I can, yes. I can. No, that, that, that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make is, is yes, um, especially in COVID, there yes. has been a lot less, um, obviously, in-person monitoring and, and just monitoring in general, right? Right. Um, and, and what you said is very true to the research group that I work with is that a lot of our monitoring is, is by ourselves and second checking ourselves and, and trying to build a culture of quality just within our own, our own research team. So right. um, I just wondered, yeah, if you had any general advice for those specific scenarios when it is kind of on, on yourself, on your team, and there aren't uh, necessarily specific funds just for, you know, clinical monitoring. Right. I think what you've, I think you've, you, you've, what you've said is true. You build, you know, the, the best you can do is to build within your team um, as many quality double checks that you can. That's probably the least expensive. You know, there's always the ideal of having a totally independent person just look at your your research I, and do a, a quality check on it. Um, but that costs a lot of money. I would tell you that another thing I didn't mention here is there are clinical research sites who actually have someone on board who's a quality manager, period. And that's their job. Um, and I could see a scenario whereby if you had a quality manager, they would do a lot, but they would really be and they would be, and I'm just, again, funded because I've, I've done budgets before, but they would really be funded off of every single protocol that you have going on, you know, just little bits so that when they can help manage the office, they can also, um, they can also take up the, the slack when there is not a monitor. Um, so again, that's an, another way I, of doing it. And they also, again, it, because it's their specific job, they're pretty separated from everybody else because that's their title. They don't involve themselves with study subjects or um, any study protocol implementation. They're just available. You know, and, and I'm going to tell you all this, and if I probably could get in trouble for saying it, but in my, in my brain, if we could use some of the indirects we bring in for these sorts of people, <laughs> it would make a world of difference in the strength of our research. But I don't handle the budget and I'm not, I don't run an academic institution. So it's not fair for me to say. So let me add to that for NIH studies. Yes, uh, investigator initiated studies still need to be monitored. All studies need to be monitored at some point. As far as doing some of the quality checks, when I was in that realm, while at Children's, um, we would self-check one another for those NIH studies. So mm -hmm. one of my protocols, I would choose a coordinator that was not on my protocol and they would do some of the self-checks as far as uh, consents, study endpoints, and those types of things. We later moved to a role where as the educator, I was also a quality manager, where when we first started a study, the first couple of, of patients, I would do um, those quality checks. And then later, as even when monitors did come in, I would always check all of their reports, looking for those um, items that were um, being repeated for er areas where we might need new education or to re-educate. So there are ways to do it for even the small very small uh, siloed areas, you can sometimes ask a uh, colleague in another area, um, would you guys like to monitor mine and I'll monitor yours, um, just so that someone is taking a second look at those um, uh, visits and making sure that a minimum, you, you would kind of set out, at least check these items, the consent, did they have their um, all of their labs completed before you enrolled them and things like that? It, it is helpful to, to kind of trade off. Um, and sometimes that's the best we can do. 
That was good, Karen. Thank you. So um, I think that that's, I don't know if there's any more questions. We will be sending out a copy of the slide deck. Um, as Penny said, there's a lot in there for us to look at and to pull out and see where we could maybe put some of that quality into our um, our everyday. And, and it is a mindset that you want to achieve that. Um, compliance, we will be speaking about in the next couple of months. Uh, we're going to be asking um, both of the compliance office and uh, the Office of Research within the College of Medicine will be presenting as well as someone from the CTO um, about compliance. But as Penny said, compliance is, I mean, that's the minimum. You have to at least be compliant. Quality goes on top of that. Quality is the icing on the cake um, that makes you stand out. It makes sponsors want to come back to you. And also in looking at all of the uh, misconduct that is b currently being very highly reported and looked at, it means the difference of something going out there with the wrong um, slides attached or the information being incorrect. Quality is caring about that product that you produce so it doesn't go into the misconduct file or have to be retracted. Um, and I think that's also something that uh, PI should be interested in is the quality of the study that is going out there that someone's not going to uh, look at it and say it needs to be retracted for poor quality. Um, and it is important. And that also helps with our recruitment because the more misconduct that is reported, the less likely that those uh, individuals that you're trying to recruit um, want to participate in studies because of what they see. So it, it's all connected. Um, so final call for any questions for Penny. Um, I thank you for joining us and I hope that this is a start of a new year for us, um, that things can improve for us. Please be safe, keep your distance, wear your masks, get your vaccinations, um, and hope to be able to see you face-to-face -face sometime in the future this year. Thank you.